I'm Trish Roberts Miller, and um, I always tell people that what I'm mo most interested in are train wrecks of public deliberation. And that means that I like to look at the times when a community or city state or state has come to an incredibly bad decision. And they've taken a long time to do it, and they've had a lot of discussion. And anytime you study that sort of thing, you end up talking a lot about fallacies. So one thing I have is right here, I actually have a handout on the web on fallacies, and there's even a, a PDF. Um, and I wrote that for a class that I do on demagoguery, so it may or may not be useful for your purposes. But basically, it's super easy how fallacies work, because um, a classic thing you probably already know about, you may have even done in your class, is just to make a list of what are the characteristics of a good discussion versus a bad discussion, or a good disagreement versus a bad disagreement. And typically you end up with a particular list, and it's just stuff like in a good disagreement, people listen to each other, um, they don't scream, they don't threaten, they don't insult each other, they try to stay on topic, they try to give evidence, they actually know a lot about the topic, uh, and they stay on topic, right? So those are the basic things. And essentially what fallacies are, are fallacies are some way that people don't do that, or that they keep each other from doing that, or that they... Um, and so what happens with fallacies is, for the most part, the list that we have can be kind of crazy. And you can, if you look on the internet, you may have seen lists of fallacies that go to um, 20 or 50 characteristics and have lots of Latin titles. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Latin titles, but very, very little because they don't matter. It doesn't matter what you call them. What really matters is what, um, that you do them or that you don't do them or that you catch when somebody else does them. So the first thing that typically when people list what makes a good disagreement is you listen to each other. And um, the fallacies that violate that basic rule are typically um, that you don't listen and you don't listen because you threaten people with harm if they continue to talk. And that is called um, ad baculum or hitting people with a stick. So anytime you tell people that they have to shut up or you're going to hit them or hurt them in some way, that's the fallacy of ad baculum. The other one is ad hominem, which people know a lot, and ad hominem is a personal attack. Um, you have to be careful about the fallacy of ad hominem, though, because attacking somebody's credibility is not an attack on the person. So you've committed the fallacy of ad hominem when you say, you aren't allowed to participate in this discussion because, and then you bring up essentially some kind of um, inflammatory comment about them or insult, uh, rather than an attack on their argument. The most common one, I think, is straw man. And straw man is um, where you misrepresent the, um, the opposition argument. I find this one really fascinating because it's one that people commit all the time without meaning to. And the way that people do the straw man fallacy is one really common one is you introduce a never or an always into somebody else's argument. So if I say something like, um, you know, teen drivers tend to be worse drivers, if you say, so you're saying all teen drivers have car accidents, that's not what I said, right? That's a straw man. You've taken my argument and made it stupider and therefore easier to knock down. <clears throat> so, um, in, in fact, there's a really interesting exercise that some people do in teaching argumentation where they ask, they invite two students to argue and then they say to them, okay, now um, summarize the other person's position in a way that the other person will say, yes, that's my argument. And it can take half an hour before people can actually really hear what the other person is saying and represent it fairly. So that's why I make a big deal about straw man. And I think if you get past straw man, you're going to have a good discussion. Um, that's really the one that matters. Um, another one, though, is so you have to represent positions fairly and accurately. Another way that people don't do that um, is some version of red herring. Inflammatory language is a kind of red herring. Um, but then also red herrings can be a way that you don't stay on topic. So you get distracted by something really smelly. The explanation I've always heard about red herring is that um, it came from people who were opposed to fox hunting. And what they would do is they would actually drag a herring across the fox trail, and so the hounds would follow that. So essentially that's what red herring is, is it's just an, it's some kind of statement or argument that is so inflammatory, everybody's going to get distracted and follow that. Um, so those are also called the fallacies of relevance. And um, argumentum ad misericordium is one of those. It's an appeal to pity. A lot of people think that any appeal to emotion is a fallacy, but it's not. Um, appeals to emotion are perfectly valid kinds of arguments to make. They're not fallacious. They're only fallacious when they're irrelevant. So if 
it's in, so you always have to figure out whether this is a relevant or irrelevant appeal to emotions. But if we're talking about genocide, the fact that, I mean, if I were to try to appeal to your sense of outrage, that would be perfectly relevant and a perfectly valid argument to make. But if I were to say to you that um, <clears throat> you should um, give me a better grade because I'll cry, that would be um, argumentum ad misericordium. Another one that's in there is um, argumentum ad vericundium, which is a fallacious appeal to authority. And appeal to authority is actually an extremely important part of argument. It's a really useful thing. It's a great thing to do. But when it's done fallaciously is when you appeal to an authority who's not really an authority on the issue. Um, you misrepresent what they say. Um, you appeal to somebody who is an authority but not specifically relevant to that um, case. So. Um, I might, I'm an authority on argumentation, citing me on argumentation is perfectly fine, but citing me on earthquake prevention or something would be um, a fallacious appeal to authority. And um, then also a really important thing that people want in an argument is they want evidence, right? And they want evidence that's valid. And so one whole set of fallacies has to do with um, what's sometimes called argument by assertion, and that is instead of giving evidence to support your argument, you just keep restating your argument, sometimes in different terms and sometimes not. Um, if you're restating the argument in different terms, that's called a circular argument, which in um, the Latin actually translates to begging the question. So sometimes when people use the phrase begging the question, that's what they mean. They mean that you're actually, um, you're in the course of making an argument, uh, assuming the very thing that is at stake. If we had more time, I'd give you examples. But anyway, um, and then another one that is really common is post hoc ergo propter hoc. And that is where you um, assume that just because something followed something else, it was caused by something else. So for instance, if I draw a pentagram on my forehead and my headache goes away, and I conclude therefore drawing a pentagram on my forehead made my headache go away, that would be post hoc ergo propter hoc because I haven't taken into consideration that I also took some aspirin or I drank some water or I took a nap or something. So um, lots and lots of bad science fits into the post hoc ergo propter hoc category. Another one is the genus species um, fallacy, and that's where you take a single example or even a small number of examples and assume that it's true of the whole. So a species is a singular specific instance or um, being within a larger general category or genus. So if I were to say that um, all dogs like tennis balls because my dog likes tennis balls, that would be a genus species fallacy. If I were to assume that all dogs have four legs because that's because the definition of dogs, I might be making a genus species fallacy because there are in fact three-legged dogs out there. Um, and sometimes people call that overgeneralization too. Then um, also the, there's a whole set of fallacies, and these are the really hard ones, uh, that have to do with whether a person is actually logically drawing conclusions that follow from what they're saying. When somebody uh, violates those basic rules, those, that's called non sequitur. And, um, and as I said, those are really complicated, but essentially the best way to look at those, I think, is um, if you have taken a geometry class where you did like set theory and they did Venn diagrams, just imagine that, that if you draw a circle that fits a certain category and then you think about, um, so uh, Texans are, speak English. Well, you know, what's, what does that look like? You have te a set of Texans, you can draw that circle, and then you have people who speak English. That's going to be overlapping with the circle of Texans, but not exactly the same. That's kind of weird, but anyway, it should make sense. And um, then using terms consistently is a fairly important one. When people violate that rule, it's called equivocation. And um, my favorite example of that one is, oh, I'll have to just say it. So. Um, my favorite example of that one is that uh, God is love, love is blind, Stevie Wonder is blind, therefore Stevie Wonder is God. If you look back, if you write that down and you look at the way that the words are being used, you'll see that in each case there's a slight variation on what you mean by is. Sometimes you mean it has this characteristic of, sometimes you mean it um, is among other things, this thing. And that, so that's classically equivocation. And people will often do that with what um, in rhetoric are called loaded terms, that is big, broad, important terms 
that people have strong feelings about but can't necessarily define very well, like freedom or um, patriotism. And so sometimes you get fallacies of equivocation where people are not being clear as to how they're using those terms. Um, and then the final thing that is simply that in a good argument, people explain whatever needs explaining. And in a way, you could take all these different fallacies that I've talked about and um, said that what they do is they're all violations of that basic rule. That in some way, you have a disagreement with somebody else or with another kind of person. And what has to happen is the two of you have to focus on that. To make a good argument, you need to explain what that person needs explaining. And a fallacy is just a refusal to do that. So that's basically all it is.